Good evening, Greater Love family and friends. I'm Deacon Sims, and thank you for tuning in to this Wednesday in the Word. First, giving honor and reverence to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, who is the reason I am able to sit here before you tonight. To my pastor, whom my family and I love dearly, I say thank you, sir, for allowing me to use this platform to try to say a little something. I pray it lines up with the vision that you have for this time. And to my ministry leader, Deacon Banks, Thank you for entrusting me with this opportunity. I do not plan to be before you long, just a few brief moments, and I will bid you adieu. If you will meet me at Proverbs chapter 21, verse 2, we will begin and end our reading there. And it reads, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the heart. Or as it says in the ESV version, the Lord weighs the heart. That ends, our, that ends the reading of our word of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May he, add, may he bless the hearers, the readers, and doers of his word. Shall we pray? Father God, we come to you right now, Lord, first and foremost saying thank you right now, dear Heavenly Father. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to gather right now, dear Heavenly Father. Even virtually, God, we say thank you right now, dear God. I ask you right now, Lord, that you will use me as you see fit, God, speak through me and allow your word to go out right now to Heavenly Father. I pray right now, Lord, that maybe lives are changed and, 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 and transformation takes place in, 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 in homes right now to Heavenly Father because of you right now to Heavenly Father. Use me, Lord, speak through me, God. Increase while I decrease. All these things we ask in your daughter and son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. With all this time that we have spent at home over the last year, I'm sure we've watched our fair share of TV. As I pondered and prayed on where, to, where the Lord wanted me to bring this lesson from, he spoke to me through the very TV I was watching. It's a rather familiar commercial by a financial institution named Capital One. And all their commercials seem to end with those famous words, what's in your wallet? And I said, thank you, Lord, I, I think I can work with this. So for just a few moments, I want to raise the question, what's in your heart? I believe we live in an ex ex extraordinary time, a time where our country is as divided as I've seen it in my lifetime. We were, rec we were, we were re recently removed from lackluster leadership. Social media has become a steady source of news. The political climate is in an uproar. And people are eager to know where you stand. You're kind of forced to pick a side and predicated on where you choose to stand and whom you choose to stand with, we as human beings begin to judge your heart. Because we are, we are people who have been told since we were kids to follow our hearts and follow our dreams. And where I do not disagree with that, at times it is understandable to follow our hearts, but as Christians, we have to stop and ask ourselves, does this line up with what God wants for me? Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 reads, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for, for from it flows the springs of life. The heart is a reservoir, and change must begin there. If the reservoir is polluted, it does no good to fix the pipes. We may need, to complete, we may need a complete overhaul and to examine ourselves in our circumstances. As humans, we tend to rationalize things and believe our views and choices are correct. But the greatest scrutiny for our decisions is not, is not our own eyes, but rather the Lord God who weighs our heart. For example, let us take a look back at 1 Samuel chapter 16. Here we have a distraught Samuel mourning the rebellion of Saul when God speaks to him and tells him to fill his horn with oil and go and see Jesse for God had chosen one of his sons to be king you shall anoint for me the one I named to you so Samuel went 
And while at the sacrifice, Samuel begins to look over Jesse's sons. Samuel looked at Jesse's oldest son, Eliab, and thought, he sure looks good. He looks like a king. He's tall. He's handsome, good looking. And even with all that, God rejected him. Then God told Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have refused him, for the Lord does not see as man see. For men look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God addresses a problem here that I believe that we're still dealing with today. We love to look good on the outside because that's our disguise. It throws people off. We may look good, but the truth is there may be no good in us. What about our heart? What's going on in there? The truth is it's very hard to be completely honest with ourselves. We like to see what we want, and nine times out of ten, it's not the truth. I wonder what we would discover about ourselves if we sat down and took honest inventory of our hearts. Ask yourself, would it be pleasing to God? So I quickly want to touch on a few points and a few things that I believe God, when weighing our hearts, would expect to find. The first is faith. We are all familiar with Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, that reads, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the foundation of our relationship with God. Faith at its core is deep-rooted in the expectation of good things to come. While life can be hard at the best of times, faith is the knowledge deep down in our hearts that things will get better. Faith is taking the next step when you can't see the entire staircase. But in your heart, you trust God enough to move at his command. Life would fail to have much meaning if we allowed our heart to be absent of faith. I mean, we couldn't even drive vehicles or fly on planes. I mean, isn't it funny that we allow a pilot to launch, launch us 30,000 feet into the air and we've never met him? We know nothing about him, how he lives, but we trust him to fly and land us safely to our destination. But when you have a relationship with God, your faith says, I don't need to know the earthly pilot because I know the heavenly pilot. When we have faith in our hearts, we can move mountains. There is little to no explanation for it in the physical realm, but check out Check out this big word, as, as my pastor would call it, one of those $20 words. It's the metaphysical fiber that binds us all, carrying our deepest desires. That's where faith lives. Faith is just as the air we breathe. While oxygen nourishes the, nourishes the body, faith nourishes the heart and soul. It's the energy that courses through every single fiber and cell within our being. It is the fundamental foundation for our existence. So I ask you tonight, is faith in your heart? The second occupant of our heart that I believe God should find is humility. This is a staple of the Christian heart. I said this before in another teaching opportunity that humility is the wardrobe of God's people. Countless times throughout scripture, we see God give mercy to those who humbled themselves before him and changed their hearts. God even withheld his wrath from evil men who turned toward him in humility. Humility is a powerful thing that when we choose to submit to the Lord in all we do and to surrender every part of our lives to him, we will be rewarded. Humility still allows for self-confidence, but it is the opposite of pride. It allows others to, to be the center of attention. In this case, we're talking about God. The importance of humility 
being present in our hearts is directly related to the consequence of pride. Because pride separates us from God as we are unwilling, unwilling to acknowledge or appreciate who God is and all that he has done for us. Humility allows us to recognize our own flawed nature and susceptibility to sin. To borrow a quote from C.S. Lewis, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. So I ask, is humility in your heart? My third point is tough and maybe the most difficult, forgiveness. Even though it's a struggle, God deems it mandatory. He tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. I could be honest and say I still wrestle with this one sometimes. I think I have it pinned down and somehow it seems to slip free. But I continue to work at it because God demands it of us. And he has every right to do so, being that he is the poster child, if you will, for forgiveness. Forgiveness is more than the softening of your heart towards someone who wronged you. It's more about, I'm sorry, the softening of your heart towards someone who wronged you, rather than just the words of an apology. It actually deals with the state of your heart. It's a heart softened by God to love others as he loves you. We have been the beneficiary of God's forgiveness, but sometimes our stubbornness gets in the way of us forgiving others. We have been tasked to forgive others, and I'm, suggesting, and I'm not suggesting that it's the easiest thing in the world to do. But as always, but always remember, excuse me, while on the cross, Jesus forgave his killers. So I ask today, is, is forgiveness in your heart? My last and final point is worship. We were made to worship God. It should be our direct connection to him. For example, if we were the plug, then that means God is the outlet and we're powerless without him. Worship is a condition of the heart. It doesn't have to hinge on the last thing the Lord did for us. It could be activated just just through the thought of who God is. We should be consistent in our pursuit of God and in our worship. Our goal should be to make worship a lifestyle and not just a Sunday morning ritual. Secondly, we should, we should be expectant because your worship is not in vain. We've heard the saying, when praises go up, the blessings come down. So we must have worship in our heart, and it should be freely given to God. While we, are on a, while we are on the subject of worship, I'm reminded of something that happened um, the week that we experienced our snow and, and power outages. Um, I had a realization, and, and God revealed something to me. Um, so Tuesday night um, of that week, as the family and I sat around a cold house, um, no electricity. Um, I was blessed to receive some wood uh, from a friend, some firewood. Uh, so we threw some in the fireplace and, and we lit it. We all huddled around the fire trying to warm ourselves. And my mind wandered back to the time of us choosing the different appliances um, from the builder we were building the house and how initially the fireplace was deemed to be decorative piece and um, how the cur current situation required it to be functional. So I just wanted to tell someone out there, God did not create us to be decorative, but he created us to be functional, to worship him because he is worthy. Situations will arise but he is still worthy. So we must have worship in our hearts. I'm asking, do you have worship in your hearts? If God came now and 
to take inventory, if he came right now to weigh our hearts, would it be pleasing? Would it be enough? So I, kind of, I leave you asking, what's in your heart? Shall we pray? Father God, we come right now, Lord, first and foremost saying thank you right now, dear Heavenly Father. Thanking you for your word that went out right now, dear Heavenly Father. We, we pray that it touched lives right now, dear God. We ask right now, Lord, that you will align our hearts with your, your will right now, dear Heavenly Father. We, al we, we ask right now, Lord, that you would, you would find these, these fundamental basics right now in our heart right now, if you were to search them right now, dear Heavenly Father. Lord, we ask special blessing upon our pastor right now, God. Touch him and keep him wherever he may be right now, dear Heavenly Father. Lord, continue to use him and speak through him right now, dear Heavenly Father, and allow us to be obedient to your word right now, dear God. We want to say that we love you, God. We want to say that we magnify you right now, God. All of these things we ask in your darling son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.